Hi everyone, this is Julie Martinez Hayes. I am the assistant professor at Wake Tech. I'll be teaching your class this semester, and today is the NOS 110 lecture for chapter one. All right, my basic info is here. My email, jkmartinezhayes at wakeTech.edu. You can reach me by Teams email. Uh, just look for that Teams dot. If it's green, I'm online, and usually I have a note about something else. Uh, chapter one bounces all over the place because it's trying to summarize the textbook. We're going to basically be summarizing your entire chapter, so don't be intimidated if it covers way too much information like the entire history of computing because it's going to do it in a fairly cursory way and then we get into more detail later. There is background with the history of Linux and um, the, the IBM Microsoft squabble because it produces at least three operating systems that I know of right off the top of my head. So uh, we do discuss devices and what an inter what an operating system is and what it's supposed to do as opposed to what people think it's doing. There's a timeline in your textbook that you will need to know. Um, pages 9 and it actually stretches through so get a sense of what started when, who built what, and I'll highlight some of some of the uh, important dates in the lecture. Um, we do cover a little some Linux and Unix and Apple and Mac operating system versions as well. Uh, the course itself focuses on Windows and Linux. Uh, this overview chapter will cover a little bit of everything. All right, so an operating system itself is a, a collection of programs that handles the processes between the hardware and the actual applications that the user is using. And that's important to remember that the user generally isn't uh, interacting directly with the operating system. They're interacting with software that might be telling the operating system to do something, like creating a new user. Okay, So the operating system, which I abbreviate OS because it saves a lot of space on the slides, um, the OS is a, a bit of a traffic controller. Uh, but it's dealing with the applications and the demands on the hardware. So which application needs to print right now and which application needs to use the camera or the microphone? Um, which one needs a whole lot of processing information right this second? Because you might be streaming a movie or gaming. Um, so that's the kind of thing that the operating system's doing. Uh, uh, there are a lot of terms in the early days of computing for what was later called a personal computer. They called a, a microcomputer also. So there are some terms we need to know. So for a microcomputer, it was small enough that you could pack it in a car, but it wasn't always very portable. And I've got some images here of a, looks like a Lisa or possibly a Mac Plus, although I don't see the... Yep, that's a Mac Plus. And we've got the IBM and and Apple, and I don't know if you know what that thing is. Um, so I actually have to remember what my images are. But realistically, they're going to have a, a monitor, a keyboard, some input thing, and some storage thing. And it might be a gaming system with a joystick or even um, a training system to train you how to fly before aviation training software could fit on a personal computer. So we had separate systems to do that. Um, the other uh, concept for microcomputer was reasonable price. So it was designed for either home or business and the price had to be you know, less than a mortgage, uh, which was not the case for the very first personal computers, the microcomputers. Um, there was one called Lisa that I think cost $5,000 in the 80s. So that is not realistic. That's not reasonable. Uh, as for the other expectation, which is useful, op ap uh, useful applications, uh, useful applications in, the, in those days when it was beginning was mostly 
number crunching, so financial or anything that did some sort of math or scientific calculations, things like extrapolation, uh, or word processing, or simple artistic design. Very, very simple. Most of the time it was word processing and number crunching, with number crunching being the higher priority because folks could type easily enough, but calculating numbers on the fly and then changing one field and having it change all of the rest of the, the calculations, the calculated fields, that was something that was really special about software in the beginning. Um, so that was the early definitions of microcomputer, but we have to be realistic about what, what it is to us now, which is anything with a chip. So it could be your refrigerator or your coffee machine or the laundry machine that is telling you right now that the dryer is done and you might be getting the message on your Fitbit. So all of these things are small computers. One of the ways we have to think about the computer is the data. How is it getting data from us and how is it getting data back out? So those are input and output. The input and output, usually in a class, I would throw this back to you and say, what are some examples? Uh, what is your input? And most folks would look down and say, oh, it's a keyboard, it's a mouse, uh, it's a touch screen. Right? So those are the things that are around them. But voice is also an input. And you can do voice to talk, you can have voice commands opening it. Uh, think of Siri, you are at, you're telling commands you're, you're speaking commands and something happens. That's an input and then the output would then be the music that plays or the command to dim lights or turn on something. Those That is out, a form of output. Um, there are other forms of input that most people don't think of, such as gestures. Uh, so swiping gestures can be an input. Uh, temperature can be an input. So if we can have software that says if the temperature rises above um, 78 degrees to do this thing, this uh, take this action, and it might be turning on the fan or adjusting the 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 heating system, the AC. Um, what else? Uh, position, uh, position and levels. Um, so as water rises. You may have some software that says, oh, if the level gets up to this, we're going to trigger an action, open a valve, and something drains. Or it could be GPS. Where are you? Well, if you're in this location, pop up a message that says, hey, you're near Starbucks. Okay, that, that is input and output. The input is the GPS, and the output would then be the message, the message box you know, flashing up on the screen. So those are inputs and outputs. What is the most common output that people actually don't think about is to the screen. So output can be to a printer, but it also can just be pop up to the screen. You're, you're pushing data and the monitor is the primary way it gets pushed out. It could be to a printer. It could be to a sensory device for Braille. Um, th there are many types of outputs. But again, in a classroom, I would be asking you what all these are, um, but I'm going to pop them up. One of the options that people forget to think of is uh, speakers and sounds. So think of all of your senses, the five senses. We don't have taste quite yet, uh, but we're, I'm sure they're working on it. Um, the location, in terms of if the computer has wheels, the output might be uh, when I say location, like if the input were the where is the GPS located, the output could be, um, will move my automated car to find me. So if I'm lost and I have a driverless vehicle, autonomous vehicle, I can plug in the app that says, come to this location. And I would just wait and the autonomous vehicle would come to me. So that could be a computer on wheels that comes to me. Okay, so that's that's the concept of input and output. It's getting information from us, it's taking an action, and it's doing something to something else. Well, sometimes it's just 
software calculating a message popping up on the screen. Okay. We're going to cover a little bit of hardware because even though this is not an operating system class, it's an impossible to get away from the hardware perspective of it. Too often we think we're operating the computer when we're really using an application that operates the computer. So we use these terms very vaguely and, and in a general fashion um, and they get merged a little bit. So there's a piece of software that is on a device and that's called firmware. So we think of a device like a printer or um, any kind of attachment, anything that attaches to a computer as being a piece of hardware when in fact there's a piece of software running the piece of hardware. That makes sense? Okay, so it's there's software telling the plastic and metal what to do. And it's the software that we usually interact with or the, operate, the operating system would first interact with it to tell it what to do. Uh, a common one, I've got a picture there of a network adapter. This is a, a, a style of adapter card that would go onto a tower computer. It would be a um, network adapter where you'd plug in the cable. So there is software on that device. So we could look at a, a network adapter and say, okay, it's a piece of hardware. It's like, well, there's actually software on those chips. So when you see chips on a board like that, those chips hold software. And in a simple, small thing like this, it could just be what driver, what are the rules that make this hardware work? But on a bigger panel, like those big gray boxes you see in some telecom rooms, that might be a chip that holds the entire security system for the badges to get in and out of the building. So, so when people have chipped ID badges and have to flash their badge against a reader to get through a door, the entire database that's running that could be on a chip that's sitting on a board. Um, firmware is usually built into uh, monitors but we can update them. They sit on phones, so they get a firmware gets updated. Um, motherboards have chips on them as well, and we have to update the computers. So pretty much any hardware with a chip has some tiny piece of hard firmware on there, the chip, that tells it how to operate. The bigger pieces of hardware uh, involve the processor, which is the brains of the unit from the hardware perspective. Processors also called a CPU or central processing unit. We've got RAM, that's uh, memory. They, there are chips on a card, a little piece of board that slide into a slot. Laptops generally have one memory slot. So when you wanna add memory, you have to replace the entire memory card. Tower computers would have more than one memory slot, four slots and you have to put them in generally in pairs that match each other. The motherboard is a big plast plastic breadboard, if you're familiar with the electronics term. It has a lot of devices on it. It has ports on it to add power connectors. It has resist resistors on it, and it has batteries. We'll look at that a little bit. Uh, storage, from the hardware perspective, storage can be uh, a hard drive that spins, or it can be a solid state drive, which is just solid pieces of metal and the, the, the ones and zeros get written to the metal itself, uh, which is more secure, it, it lasts longer. The disk spinning type of store, a hardware storage on a hard drive has a lubricant in between lots of little disks, and the more you use it, the more it spins, the more that lubricant gets pushed to the edge and that hard drive would make a horrible ground grinding noise and then it dies. So if you have a computer and you hear it making a horrible grinding noise, you have limited time to get the data off that hard drive. Other storage could be in memory. There could be built-in storage like in a phone. You've got a chip in your phone um, so it's for storage. Um, so storage can come in different formats. Other hardware are things that cool it off, like the fans, um, the power supply, all the cables, the network adapter, 
Uh, and like I mentioned, there is a battery. I've got a picture of it, but we do have a battery on the motherboard so that it can keep time when the power is when the computer is powered off and you unplug it, it's still keeping the proper time. Oh. And uh, I don't recall the date it goes back to, but it's something wonky. I think it's in the 1600s or the 1300s, but the year goes very wonky when that particular battery goes bad. A couple of pictures of these things, uh, processors, there's usually a, a socket to that on the motherboard to receive the CPU when you receive the processor. There's a processor with little teeth that fill, that go into that socket. And there's something that sits on top of the processor uh, called a heat sink. And um, there's some special adhesive between the heat sink and the processor. What the heat sink does, it just pulls the heat off the processor and lets it go up. Now, if you think of a skinny little laptop, that heat is going off a processor into a skinny little area. So laptops will heat up faster and be careful where the hot air is going out on a laptop. Also on a laptop, be careful where the cool air is going in, which might be underneath. You do not want to block that area. Don't let it get dusty. Uh, it's very important to keep the processor cool. Otherwise it shuts down. And in the worst, worst case scenario, the whole thing dies, but most computers are designed to shut themselves off if they are overheating. Okay, that's an input of temperature, an output of a power down script. Okay, the pieces are in the two left pictures and on the far right it's all, all pushed together and clipped in on the motherboard. So with memory, um, known as RAM, stands for Random Access Memory. Um, this memory, excuse me, this memory um, is will be shown, like I said, on a little piece of, of card, but will have chips on it. And each chip will have be, be worth some memory. Um, usually there's a group of chips on a, on a board like that, and the sticker will tell you how much RAM that, that board is worth when you so that you can add to it uh, like I said on a laptop you have to replace the whole card usually the motherboard itself has lots of slots on it uh, we do have a hardware class where we could teach all this and it's a lot more fun but there are slots for video cards for extra um, sometimes multiple video cards uh, extra memory chips, there are processors, maybe an extra processor, a lot of power sockets for power cables, uh, extra drives, there's some power slots there for extra hard drives because you can keep adding hard drives, um, and the chipset socket. So you can keep adding parts and that's the one benefit to a tower computer, the bigger ones. They may not be portable but you can add a lot more parts to it and make it stronger. Stronger, faster, and cooler. Here are two types of storage uh, hard drives, like I mentioned before, the disks. There are lots of thin little layers of disks with lubricant in, in between and they spin, uh, which comes, we get terms from that too, like when we're pulling something up and we're, we're starting up something, um, whether we could say boot up a computer, we also say spin. So spin up a, a VM. So even though a VM is virtual, uh, spinning it up just means bring it up. Uh, on the right is the solid state, which is more reliable, a um, little bit cooler, I believe, definitely faster, longer lasting, and more expensive. Oh, you get what you pay for. Uh, other things in hardware, you have a lot of cables inside, don't be intimidated by them. One power supply will look like Medusa with a hair, you know, hair of snakes, head full of snakes, uh, but they go to particular places and if you look at your power supply they may not all be in use. So you can open a tower computer and look at where the power cables are going and some have very specific shapes so they will only go for the video card or for a hard drive. Um, they have some specific spots and others do not have very specific, specific spots and they can be reused. Um, also, they're going to be fans, and you'll have some for fans. Uh, and this, um, also, the CMOS battery, it's not a very good picture. It's actually of my own computer. Um, 
I should take it again since I have a higher resolution phone now. But it's it's a it's bigger than a hearing aid battery. Okay, it's like uh, but it's a battery that sits on the motherboard motherboard, and that will last longer than you will use that computer for the majority of you, vast majority. All right, what other hardware is there? Okay, we've got computers, but we have other devices that do computing. So we've got the tablets and we've got pretty much phones. And there's some overlap there. Some phones are so big, they resemble the tablets of five years ago. Uh, but how do we use them? And there are pros and cons to these. And to be totally honest, people's attitude tends to change a little bit depending on the device they have in their hand. So if they're sitting down at a computer, whether it's desktop machine or laptop, once they have the computer keyboard and the mouse, um, they kind of get into work mode a little bit. And with, with, with a phone in our hands or an iPad and we're just looking at stuff, people get more, tend to get more casual and do work quicker. I've noticed uh, myself and with some others, just just watching them work, that um, folks treat it more like a game, like tapping on tiles to get to something is no different from your favorite social media site to Blackboard reading something. Um, but when it's a, you know, bigger, heftier keyboard in front of you, people tend to slow down a little bit and actually read more thoroughly. So what are the pros and cons of these things? And w which one could you use for a lot of your work for school or your job? And what apps are limiting you? What is the limitation at all? Is it the hardware? Is it the applications written for the platform of your phone? And what would you need to do the job properly? You know, how do you right click on this thing to get to open the VM? All right, do you just need a mouse? Do you need a stylus? Or just more options on the phone? At this point in the class, I would normally take a break. So pause here, go refill your coffee, take the bio break. Don't try to watch this whole video in one setting. Okay, when it comes to the user and how the user works with this computer. It's very important to realize that we do not have um, a direct connection with the operating system. There is the exception, exception of a registry that we would change, but there is still a console we would go open and make edits to before anything changes in the operating system and how the operating system deals with the hardware. So remember the OS itself is telling the hardware what to do and when to do it. So there's a user interface to get information from us. And a lot of times it's just an app like Word. Uh, just a browser is getting information from us, from print, say. Um, but there are consoles that help a user do system changes to your operating system. Uh, we're gonna go through some of the processes that the OS does and then figure out how the user can get in there and make changes. All right, the boot process is how we start. We're getting the first when we hit the power button. Before the OS even loads, there is software on the motherboard and it's checking its parts. So basically it's like first waking up and checking that your hands and feet are there. Is everything working? Yes, everything's working. Do I have anything new? Nope, nothing new. Um, so no new hard drives, no new parts attached. The BIOS is checking this out. This is before we even know whether it's a Linux machine, a Windows machine, or anything. So this BIOS, a basic input-output system, it lives on the motherboard before the kernel of the operating system loads. Now the kernel is kind of an important part here because the kernel is the brains of an operating system the way the CPU or the processor is to the hardware. Okay, the kernel is deciding what goes on and when it's happening and who gives what. So it is a manager 
it's it is the core of the operating system it allows what memory space is reserved for what process or or hardware you could say nope this piece of memory we are just leaving that reserved for this webcam um, it tells it decides uh, what drivers are appropriate and it might decide something different is appropriate so it can say hey this webcam keeps f closing out and dying so we're gonna go use this different driver okay that's something the kernel might do but the user can actually say no I want you to use this other thing that would be a console to, to set the driver for the piece of hardware uh, the kernel might say, uh, okay, who is allowed to log on on these hours? Who is allowed to open this folder? Um, which user gets the weird wallpaper, the, the picture of the dog? Okay, you know, that's something that the kernel would do. Uh, the kernel has a lot of different jobs, actually, and some students in a previous year, last year, came up with a mnemonic that I thought was a little silly until I just made an image for it. And it was Kernel Smudgefoot. They came up with the acronym of smudge hyphen ft all right simply because it sounded like smudge foot so it covers the security aspects the memory aspects user aspects device like the device manager do we have two speakers can i turn one off permanently uh, on the laptop is there a a, a touchpad that gets in your way because your wrist hits it let's disable that that would be the device manager um, the job which is which job is running when and how also a file uh, the files management tasks that is uh, not just the permissions on the file how large is it where is it and uh, what it is its name so there's a description a, an image if you're using file explorer but then it has to go find where it is on the hard disk even though it looks like these files are all together in this little folder the, the actual writing on the hard drive is all over the place. So it has to find the files. And then there's, of course, task management. The nice thing about task management is that the user can go in and say, I don't want you to run anymore. This thing called Word or the Outlook, it's a hog and it won't shut down and that's driving me crazy. Um, so I'm going to go into the task management and I'm going to close Outlook and OneDrive and Word and all these things and my machine will be a lot faster. Okay. So that's a way the the user can tell the operating system what to do through the task management. Uh, Smudgefoot, I just made, I found a picture of a kernel. This is a Spanish kernel, uh, Spanish Civil War, Jimenez, Carlos Jimenez. Um, and I took a paint app and I smudged the, vis the visual of his foot. So we have kernel smudge foot. Okay, I know, it's crazy, but anything silly like this that re helps you remember is worth the trouble. Okay, anything that helps. And if you come up with a, a mnemonic, which is just using initial, you know, the first letters to spell something out that's pronounceable and it helps you, it's a trick to remember something. If you come up with one of those, please let me know because, um, any way that helps students learn and remember is fine by me. All right, these consoles. I've been referring to these consoles and how the user talks to it. Um, we have some that are in areas that look visually, they might look like they're just options on a website. And what I'm talking about is when you, uh, on a Windows computer, if you go to settings, there'll be a little gear and it gives you some options and you click on one and you get some other options. What you, th that's a very pretty way to get to a console. The old style consoles are not, not as pretty and uh, the files to do it directly usually end with .msc, which stands for Microsoft console. Though the security one is SecPol, for, which would be the security policy. And if you wanted to go to Firewall, instead of MSC, that one's actually um, just a WF. Yes, WF.MSC. There's also an executable that will open that console. The storage related one is Disk Management, MGMT, Disk Manage, MGMT, dot MSC. Task Manager is an executable, Task MGR. And the one that handles users, groups, shares, and some other things, it, 
the name of it on it says computer management and the name of the file in the console you're opening is COMPMGMT which sounds like computer management so you've got a lot of consoles and you've got other ways to get there through the computer so if you hit it, the, the Windows button and you type task manager or you type computer management you'll find the way to these consoles and you'll open up something that is a console the way to find out what it is you're opening type computer management right click and say properties and you probably won't get the actual console you'll see a shortcut you'll see a little button and you could say okay what is this going to it'll have a link to say this this little shortcut is pointing over there to a file that's the name of the it'll show you the name of the file that's the name of the file that is the console so if you want me to show you one of these let me know we can do this in class all right a little bit of some software history that this co chapter covers because it covers everything so if you want to take a quick break here this is a good time to pause because we're going to go into the history of computing and frankly i lived through most of it all right, a couple of trick questions to start out that people usually get wrong are how old is Gmail? When did Gmail start? When did it begin? Which is actually, I think the state, the book that it has is off. We're going to be using the book date of 2004. Um, it has different, uh, how do we say this? It has different products that are part of it and email the, the version of Gmail it's using today started in 2004 where when were webmail and web surfing begin are very different um, web surfing actually going to, opening a browser and looking at a page, web page when did that begin just pick a number at the top of your head think of it hold on to that all right, web surfing wasn't around until 1993. That's a long time ago. Okay, where were you in 1993? Did you exist? All right, 1993, um, we had computers before then. We had computers in the 80s, uh, but we couldn't surf. We couldn't get to a web page. We couldn't look up restaurant hours. We couldn't see what the menu was. Uh, we couldn't find an address for something until 1993 using a computer. You called information, you got a number, you get to the, you call the number and say, what are your hours? And maybe you get a recording that says the hours. Yeah, it was like that. And yes, we did use phone books. Uh, so the first computers, what were they used for? The first personal computers, let me caveat personal computers the kind of thing you'd have on a desk either at home or at an office what were they used for i would love to hear email me your answers right now i want to hear them okay so one of the things we are uh covering here is not only the first uh use of the computers but the first apps so I added a couple of pieces of information because the mail client was bugging me we had mail as a client on a computer not browser ma web mail but downloaded into an app mail um, in 92 so that's actually before the browser you could hook up and get an application that pulled down mail kept it in the little client this is modem days and then it would disconnect and you had your mail and you could reply to it and then turn the modem back on reconnect and it would upload your replies all right the first web mail was actually hotmail it's uh capitalized oddly on purpose here because it's html so hot html the h the t the m and the l are capitalized in the word hotmail that was 96 so that was shortly after we had a web browser the first web browser by the way was netscape navigator navigator which later kind of turned into firefox that's the companies were all purchased now all right the first apps what were the first apps actually used for again spreadsheets word processing 
drawing and the beloved sim city this was the most fun and so simple because it allowed people to be creative and design their own world so this is the beginning of the metaverse a sim city where you as a user could decide where to put the houses and where to put the buildings and where to put the store and where to put the trees and you just built out your own life and it was black dots on a gray screen I mean honestly it was it was kinda of pitiful at first and as computers got better the graphics got better the chipsets got better then the applications could do more they could do color okay but we had to wait for the hardware and the software to get a higher quality, just stronger. Okay, so those were personal computers. We had earlier computers, but they weren't personal. They couldn't fit in a car. We uh, the very first ones, um, the size of a room, and they're a little bit odd though because because the the mainframe computers from the 60s um, didn't always have an operating system on it. The first operating system was Unix that came in 69. We had computers in 65 that didn't have operating systems. You had to load those with a program. So you'd have to type your program and it, it, you'd basically be typing onto cards or actually before that we had green paper tape. Well you'd type out of a, in a dumb terminal and it would type your letters not on paper but it would punch holes into green tape that came out the side and there's a little thing there to collect the all the holes because you're punching holes in things and that green tape as you fed it into the computer that was your program so God help you if you carried that around in your backpack and it got torn you had to type it all over and if you were typing this program and it you know, even 20 lines didn't seem like much, but with one typo, you had to start over. You couldn't backspace because the hole was already punched in the green tape. It was a pain in the butt. All right, so operating systems actually sat on the computer and ha could stay there and just run things in its memory. I mean, 69 was really the big one for Unix. Um, Unix, some student always asks me, and I never remember off the top of my head, Uniplex Information and Computing System. It's always capitalized. It's the grandfather, grandparent of all major operating systems from this point on, with the exception of DOS, but the logic was still there from Unix. So it grew in the 70s, and then it just skyrocketed in the 80s. There were um, spin-offs, smaller versions of it, lighter versions of it that could do a little bit less. Microsoft's first was uh, Xenix, and it had it was a 16-bit Unix, which is interesting because the first operating systems were 8-bit. IBM had one, and it was a form of DOS, but ran with BASIC, so BASIC language. Apple had one in the 80s, and it was Mac OS 1. But all of these things have roots back to Unix. And we'll show you how. Um, limitations for all of this growth, though, in terms of the hardware and the operating systems, it was the chips. The chipsets and what they could do. So once 8-bit grew into 16-bit, things got faster, things got more complicated, um, more elegant, more capability. So disk drives didn't used to be there. It, disk drives were actually added, so but that meant that the, your operating system got loaded on a disk. So when you powered the thing up, there's no OS. You had to put the disk in, then you had an OS. And the disks, the o operating system might be five disks, it might be 12 disks. When you were done loading one, it asked for disk two. So you took out disk one and you put in disk two. After you loaded these 12 disks, you had DOS, and it was installed. It was running in the memory. If there was a power flicker, you lost the operating system, you had to start over, load disk 1, push it out, disk 2, push it out. Um, and it would prompt when it was ready for disk 3, 4, 5, and you'd get your operating system. So to have storage was a big deal. 
you'd have storage that actually could save the programs right there save your files save your SimCity files save your drawings and your spreadsheets and your word processing so external storage was actually external physically from the computer like a cable with a box next to it and that would be your hard drive um, it actually was a really cool thing uh, to have a 20 meg hard drive that was a big deal 20 meg hard drive on a Mac Plus and people thought you were just amazing um, the first GUI this is, this is a little side note but I think it's important to realize there are a lot of companies involved in this not just IBM Apple and Microsoft a lot of companies were using and needing the processing and they show up in the history um, that timeline that you wouldn't always expect and Xerox is probably the biggest uh, Motorola is another uh, the, the GUI, the idea of a, a visual field with little icons of things and folders that you clicked in and went into and showed more objects, that was designed by Xerox. So give them credit where it's due. Um, a mouse pointer was added. Um, the first mouse had one button, and I think I have a picture of that coming up. Um, and these are just added on things. Oh, wouldn't it be useful to have a way to point to where you want to go instead of having to go tab the up arrow. Um, earlier applications were actually character driven. Um, I don't think I have a slide of that. I can dig up one for later, but character based software meant that the menu, instead of clicking on something of a menu, um, it might say F for, for file and O for open and S for save and N for new project and you typed letter N and you got a new menu and the letters that went into more things um, it might be a letter that's highlighted or a different font color once we had those or it might be a number and you type the number of the menu option you wanted so it was a character driven menu those were painful but they were effective word processing worked fine that way um, okay hardware here is your one button mouse and yes I used one and we thought it was amazing so we didn't right click we double clicked and that was it <laughs> that's all I remember um, Xerox gets credit for the GUI Motorola gets credit for portable phone handsets so as phones got disconnected from wires Motorola was the lead on that and a, and a lot of that fed military in fact a lot of technology is fed by military demands they needed phone they needed communication they needed comms in the field how are we going to get them around so the smaller and the more portable they can make them um, it helped you know the military demands and then it trickles into the rest of the world <laughs> uh, Intel was a leader on chipsets for there. A uh, couple of things, who gets credit for the mouse? One place says Xerox, another will say uh, Stanford. I see Xerox in more places than others. Um, the first Mac uh, Apple pointer looked like a bug. And with the, with the long came with the Macs, um, when it was in use and it was doing something, the legs would wiggle. So instead of, instead of like a spinning thing or dots that look like they're falling, um, the bug's legs would wiggle on the bug. That was, that was fun. Uh, a lot of this was just made to be entertaining and it got people involved in it. So when you had, um, this, this slide should be earlier. Um, when you had applications on a disk, when you had disk drives, okay, even that, just having portable storage, you had uh, an ability to easily let someone else use software, so you could hand a program over, um, or also hand over your file. So, <laughs> this is going to sound really odd, but if you had five computers in an office and we all needed to run WordPerfect, someone could put the disk in the machine, load the app into memory, remove the disk that had the app on it, hand it to the next person, they would load it into memory, they'd be able to work on the app. So that software would pull up and we'd be opening 
files or something maybe off a different disk, put a different disk where our files were, and it would open our files and save our changes, uh, and then we'd be done. So it was very odd that you could just pop the disk right out and hand it over and it would still run because they were small enough that they stayed in RAM. They ran in memory. In RAM. All right. What made one manufacturer of computer be amazing and another manufacturer of com different computer, like hardware, we're talking IBM PCs versus Apple computers and it was there who had the killer app who had the biggest killer app at that time because it kind of changed back and forth a little bit and which one made it worth buying for a whole office suite of people because that was a huge financial commitment and the biggest one was uh, always number crunching Apple II had the first biggest one and that was called VisiCalc this will come up in trivial places and it comes up in quizzes. So let me warn you there. VisiCalc was a spreadsheet. It did financial calculations. It did basic math and it changed everything because it meant budgeting. It meant planning. Um, and if something changed, like your income changed or revenue changed, you could look at the numbers, make some numbers and change things that happened for five months later than that. For future plans so it really did change the business world it changed how business happened and it changed how fast decisions could get made so it just sped everything up all right so from early on um early 80s apple was the thing to to have but then as computer chips Got, as the chips got better, the computers got faster, and IBM had an app for called Lotus One Two Three, which is by far far powerful. Um, before Lotus, uh, when you meant set a calculation and you told the the app to do the calculation, you actually went to lunch because by the time you got back from lunch, it would have an answer for you. That's how slow they were. So with IBM things were much much faster you would still have to wait but it might be a coffee break not a meal break um, and IBM from the mid to late 80s dominated the business world not necessarily everything else but definitely the business world that meant that the Apple II's and Apple IIe's were cheaper and then filtered into the household market so as they were like the second hand thing, like last year's phone, they were less expensive, better deal, and it made it possible for um, some homeowners, better off homeowners, could afford an Apple II or Apple IIe back then. Um, but it was the killer app that made it the winner of the market share. All right, here's how something happened though with IBM. And one of the reasons they became better and faster, and it was their deal with Microsoft. And this is um, this is a, a, a notorious business deal. It's an interesting part of history, and it will show up on quizzes. So if you need to take a break, let's all take a break real quick before I get to this story. Mm. IBM knew that Microsoft had DOS and they wanted it. IBM wanted it and wanted to sell all their computers with DOS loaded. So what Microsoft did was buy a another company that made a shoddier version of, of sort of DOS. Microsoft packaged it and said we're gonna call this PC DOS. Not just DOS. PC hyphen DOS had a whole different name and that was PC DOS for IBM. That's what they got. PC DOS for IBM which meant um, it's, it's kind of like going to Costco and then reselling it with a different of the fancy label. You just change the label on it and sell it in a boutique store. Same stuff, different label. They bought it. What then what Microsoft did was they put time into it. They paid developers. They made investments. They made improvements. It came out with a different version of DOS that was better. That was called MS DOS. So because Microsoft DOS and they sold it to the clones, the people making comp computers that were the competition. And that's when hardware competition really took off. This is shortly before the time where Microsoft decided to 
produce computers because they were producing software. Um, but there were other computer producers out there. Things like Gateway. Okay. Um, after this Microsoft DOS, the, the two big parties here, IBM and Microsoft, decided to collaborate. They worked on a different product altogether, and it was called OS2. It was bigger, it was stronger, it could do more, and the personal computers couldn't really handle it. It was not helpful for them. It needed something bigger. It wasn't a bad operating system at the time, but very few had strong enough computers to run it because it needed more. It was a total resource hog. One of the more famous that used it was New York City's subway system, the transit system, MTA. When they switched to metro cards, so they were magnetic cards with money on them, that whole system ran on OS2. The beginning ATMs usually had OS2 in the background. So it was powerful enough that it could run big systems, um, but it just didn't take off with the kind of computers that most people had. After the IBM clone and PC-DOS to MS-DOS, and the MS-DOS got to the clone, the competitor machines, um, the software was written by a different company, Lotus. So Lotus could sell the software separately than where you bought your computer, you installed it, um, so you had to choose which computer to buy and then pick your software. Uh, but once you had bought those things, you could choose, do I want to use Lotus? Do I want to use this other spreadsheet written for my Microsoft DOS machine? Um, and things really took off financially. Uh, business world went with DOS. Students and home use Younger than younger than college started with um, apples because Apple II, Apple IIe were more common and more affordable. Once they got to college, it might be a new version of a computer, it might be a Mac or a Mac Plus, or you know, as it went on, the new version. But they were comfortable with Apple, so college and younger tended to stick with Apple. The business world still had the Microsoft Windows, whatever OS of the flavor was. Um, so a lot of folks, once they got out of college, were like, oh crap, no one's using Apples. No one's using these Macs. Um, I have to learn this other operating system. So, back and forth. A lot of folks started out with a, an Apple product and had to learn a Microsoft product. Here's some trivia not on the quiz. When you were in a later version of Windows, called Windows 98, it could be on a network, it could be joined on a domain, lots of people logging in, just like you would at a computer lab at the ILC. But if you wanted to get out of it, you could. So you'd have a login and password screen, and you hit escape, and it just got you to a local local computer. You could still use the operating system. And nothing, no one could track who you were. Um, there is a, another piece of trivia, Mac OS is Unix. It's actually a version of Unix. So there are a lot of Mac history of operating systems that have roots of roots of Unix, the same way Linux has roots of Unix. Um, so Mac OS is listed as an official Unix version. That should be capitalized. That's actually a typo on my part on that slide. Unix is always capitalized. Um, Another small piece of trivia is that through the 90s, uh, the Windows client software and Windows server software were the same darn thing. It's just that the license key made some things hidden. And once you added a new license key for the server, the features became available. It was all there in the, the whole time. A um, couple notes about Vista. Um, Microsoft Vista actually landed with a thud, kind of like Windows 8 did, but it was had some security improvements that allowed one user to get a virus and infect only that user's profile so that the rest of the machine wouldn't have to get wiped. So there were some interesting features to it that made sec network security a wonderful thing, uh, but software was written slightly differently, the memory resources were allocated differently, the hardware wasn't strong enough to keep up, and it just it was at the wrong time. But it actually wasn't a, wasn't a shabby um, operating system from some perspectives. Not, the users were not happy with it. 
Windows 8, again, users were not happy with it, and that was the Start menu. Folks were used to a Windows desktop for years, since Windows 3, 3.1, 3.11, it just went on. Um, so through the years, we had, you know, Windows had desktops with icons on them, and all of a sudden there's this crazy Start menu, and to get out of anything, you had to slide your mouse to the top to escape. Right? Who does that? No one knows. No one knows in Windows world to slide the mouse to the top of the screen. Um, so there were things that were very different that relied on different instincts, and it wasn't. Um, it didn't do a good job of showing the user how to deal with it. You know, it didn't say, "Hey, if you want to go up here." slide your mouse up here. Um, so a lot of users just refused, just hated it. They hacked it. They put on a different, first thing a lot of folks did was Google how to put on a Windows 7 style desktop onto a Windows 8 computer. Um, the bonus of the Windows 8 operating system is the multi-platform. So you could use exact same software, put it on a phone, a tablet, a laptop, a desktop. Didn't matter and it could find all the hardware. It could find your webcam. It could figure out if it's touchscreen or not. You didn't have to add something for touchscreen. Um, and it could just adapt. It could just say, oh, we're touchscreen now? Okay. Now I can do it this way. Um, so that was it was a smarter move from Microsoft's perspective to say, instead of having 14 different versions of this operating system to handle all the different hardware, we're going to do one. Uh, but they didn't transition this very well. So it bombed, and a lot of what Windows 10 is, is just a different interface to Windows 8. Uh, Windows 8, Windows 8.1 re reverberated, you know, reverted to the desktop and gave some options so you could have either. Uh, but folks are still fine with the tiles when they're on their phone or their tablet, but they don't like it on a computer. It's a shame. All right, break time. So we need a five minute break and this is going to be big. The next stuff coming up is Linux. Ah, so take your bio break now because it's sharpen your pencils. I know this is going a little bit longer than I wanted. I'm very sorry. Like I said, it's the whole course, but in summary. All right, the Linux is a big deal and always will be a big deal and should have been a bigger deal earlier. Linux uh, is is a version, there were several versions of Unix that were <sighs> tweaked and adjusted for people's own purposes and to one of the purposes was to be on a smaller computer. Uh, Linus Torvalds has the, the most a credit for this operating system. Uh, and hence the name, Linux, Linus. So it's like Unix, but Linus's version of Unix. Um, it's very light. It's very small. It was originally, originally done in, written in C and only had a command line. Command line is C, talked about command line interface or CLI. So when it's a command line, you're looking at a, just a basically a black screen with gray font text on it and you see one line that's active and you type stuff in and something happens and that's it a lot of changes are made to Linux all the time it is open source so people can make changes to it and call it their own there aren't files that are locked out so when when there are major changes they're called um, distros, flavors, you've got new words for the newest version of it, which can package a bunch of apps and features and things with it and go to it. Um, there, People think it's free all the time, that all Linux is free, and that's not totally true. Um, there is uh, There are two major commercial versions, Fedora and Red Hat is in our neighborhood, so uh, we've We've got internships there, um, and Ubuntu. Ubuntu is uh, the company's owned. By, it's owned by Canonical, and so those are commercial. Fedora is commercial with with fees, and Ubuntu is um, 
created by the all the world is one um, and that is free you get that for free but this is truly open source you have a lot of common flavors out there district debian is is well known gen 2 like generation 2 but it's spelled out gen 2 and it goes on and on and it changes constantly all right there is so much more we have to cover chrome chrome as not only most of us think of chrome as a browser but it is an operating system which is which what they did was was uh, very sly on their part and very smart, which is to make a, a computer that is basically nothing but a browser. All it does is browse. So it can reach all the software you want to that is browser based. And 90% of what we do is browser based. Um, maybe more than that for some, for some of us. So Chrome is an operating system. A Chromebook is the hardware that it's on. Um, the only great market for Chromebook are elementary schools middle schools not even sure high schools are using those anymore um, they're cheap they're small if you have to get thousands and thousands of students a, a computer Chromebook is really the way to go and do everything on a browser Android and iOS those are phone operating systems uh, usually our, our we cover Android in a chapter and briefly cover phone operating systems we do have another course that gets into great deal to with phone operating systems that's a more programming thing because you're dealing with c c plus plus um, and programming languages iot you're going to see this acronym a lot it means internet of things it means all the things that are connected so your doorbell is connected to the camera, which is connected to movement and a motion sensor, and those are connected to your phone. And maybe the door opening and closing is connected to your HVAC system, so it knows how many people are in the building, um, or if the dryer is running, uh, and your fridge is yelling at you because it needs a new water filter and your dryer is still saying hey the dryer was done a half an hour ago um, that's internet of things all these things being connected um, fitbit health connected to email text that's that is a major way people think of the device that they think is convenient or tracking their health and it's just sending data all over the place um, so to get ready for this chapter quiz read it again Sorry, just there's no easy way around that. Make sure that you stop and pause on terms you're not sure about. Go look them up, whether it's Google or in the book or in the PowerPoint slides. Um, review the vocabulary, the terms at the beginning of the chapter and the questions at the end of the chapter. Don't just guess at those questions at the end of the chapter you should be able to look at the four possible answers and be able to say no that's wrong I know it's wrong because and then ex and have the answer why that's wrong so it's not just finding the correct answer it's being able being able to prove that the other ans an possible answers are incorrect okay so that's part of the process of really knowing this stuff well if you're not sure what the answer is, email me, please. Uh, there are at least two things of pre-quiz prep to check. Are you ready for the quiz? Be sure you take those before Tuesday because we are having a quiz on Tuesday. All right, next week, we have even more fun next week. Next week, we do math. So we are getting into number conversions in terms of our book or textbook we don't do chapter two now we're going to do it later so go directly to th chapter three on virtualization but chapter two a we split chapter two stuff we i'm sorry lesson two lesson two stuff is split into two parts one is the number conversions where we do math and then there's virtualization about what is virtualization the math part and that can be hard for most what we're doing is taking binary numbers and switching them to base 10 switching base 10 to base 16 base 16 back to base 2 um, and how to convert them back and forth 
And if you're in computing, it should be something that you actually can do pretty easily. I will not show off the binary clock that my husband gave me just to show that really, really use this stuff sometimes. All right. In a classroom, I'd be asking if there's any questions. So I'm asking you now, what are your questions? Um, for a classroom, I usually say, I want two questions from all of you every single week from the reading. What didn't you get? What didn't make sense? Or maybe even tell me what did you learn? What surprised you? So please email me and tell me what surprised you from this chapter. Thanks. Bye-bye.